Okay, so today I'm going to tell you about the Plant Breeding and Genetics IPCALS partnership, which is certainly um, not a new partnership. It's, uh, these are two entities that have been working together for a long time. Um, in fact, on the right there is H.H. H. Love, and he is, um, according to Murph's history and others, the, the, the first Cal scientist to sort of engage in a big Cornell-led uh, international project, and that was um, the Nanking, Cornell Nanking Project in China. And so here, one of our very own plant breeders, um, the uh, former small grains breeder, was the first to lead one of these big international projects. I was looking at this picture when I was preparing the presentation. This is where, this is sort of the, the home of, of the Cornell Nan King project where a lot of the Chinese students were trained. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we put a little Asian inspired roof on the top of Bradfield and added a little <laughs> flair to our very own building? <clears throat> So I'll start by kind of trying to explore what is international programs in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Um, I think that it's, to some we're kind of a, a mysterious entity up there in the corner of Emerson Hall. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as kind of the fourth dimension of, of CALS. So CALS is all about teaching, research, and, and extension. And then we bring to it sort of this international um, aspect of this international lens. So anything in CALS um, that's international could um, potentially flow through our office, whether it's an MOU or um, a student program or a course that's uh, related to international agriculture or a sponsored project that um, involves international partners. And hopefully by telling you a little bit about what we do in the next um, few slides, you'll start to have an idea about what it is that, that we do internationally. And there's a lot of you in the room who are involved in a lot of what we do. So if I get something wrong or you'd like to add something, feel free to jump up and, and chime in. So I just want to go through a few of our flagship programs um, to sort of give you a sense of some of what we do. Um, the Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship Program is something that we're proud of. We've been doing it since 1979. And this is part of the kind of mid-career um, professional leadership development programs um, that we have here in IPCALS. <clears throat> um, the Humphrey Fellows actually have a seminar series this semester, which is really exciting, that uh, explores um, climate change. And unfortunately, it's at this very same time, so you're probably um, missing it from week to week. But these are some of this year's fellows who are, are leading that seminar series. And then we also have a Borlaug Fellows program um, that brings scholars in from around the world. And both of those programs are um, managed by Francine Jasper. And um, Peter Gregory leads the uh, Humphrey Fellows program. We have a lot of uh, programming with the Peace Corps, and that includes uh, degree options. So you can get a Master's of Professional Studies um, through our office and through Cornell um, by doing also a stint with the Peace Corps to get your uh, on the grounds international experience. And that might happen, it might happen that you come to Cornell and do some coursework and then go to the Peace Corps, or there are other programs where you go to the Peace Corps, get your on the ground experience, and then you come to Cornell and um, do your academics and then get a master's degree. <clears throat> We have a lot of fellowships through our office as well, and I want to highlight this one, the Frosty Hill Fellowship, mostly because um, it might appeal to some of the people in, in the audience, and also the, the deadline is coming up, so I thought it'd be a good one to promote. So the Frosty Hill Fellowship has, has been with us for quite some time, and the goal of it is to help support originally faculty to go work at CGIR centers and form collaborations with CGIR centers. And this year is the first year that it's been opened up to graduate students. So if you're a graduate student and you're interested in working with a CGI partner, um, any of the centers qualify, then I would encourage you to get in touch with me and I'll send you the solicitation for this um, award. But basically it allows some short-term support to collaborate with the C CG center. And this is our own Jessica Rutkowski working with Robbie Singh at Simmet, not through a Frosty Hill, but a nice picture nonetheless. <laughs> okay, we have a lot of um, courses in international ag and, and rural development which lead to uh, our degree program, so both graduate degrees and undergraduate degrees. 
Um, the undergraduate uh, degree programs are largely led by Peter Hobbs, who most of you know, and the graduate degrees in global development, the DGS, is Steve Kyle from AEM. We have a lot of experiential learning opportunities for students through IARD. There's the Experience Latin America course uh, that goes to Mexico. There's the um, India course that goes to India each January. And these are all um, really, I think, key courses in offering our students opportunities to really see what agriculture looks like in a lot of these developing countries. There are other student experiences that happen through our office all around the world. Um, this is taken from our website, and if you go to the IPCALS website and you, and you go to this map, you can click on any of these pins and read about some of the student experiences in some of these countries. So if you are headed off to any of these places, um, it might be interesting to, to look into what our students have experienced. The number of IARD students is on the rise, so it's uh, an increasingly popular major, um, as you can see, in the last decade. Uh, and that's pretty exciting for our program, although it does pose some uh, challenges in terms of a faculty uh, that needs to teach to all of these great young scholars. Another program that we have through um, Cornell is the West African Center for Crop Improvement, and this is especially relevant to, to plant breeding. So this is a really um, wonderful institute that's located in Ghana, engages <coughs> scholars from around West Africa who have master's degrees. Um, and they come to get their PhD training um, here at, the, at WACI. And the idea is that um, perhaps it's arguably better to train African scientists in Africa so that they are um, better equipped to implement what they learn into their um, realistic research scenario. And this um, is a grant funded by a project that's funded by AGRA. Uh, Margaret Smith is the PI on the grant. And Vern and Stefan have really um, led the implementation of this program. Ronnie's on the board and very involved. And a lot of the faculty here, I see Tim Setter in the audience, and I'm thinking, oh, I knew I was going to forget somebody. I know Tim contributes to the, um, the program. Um, Lisa has contributed for a number of years, and Susan and Janelle also contribute. And it's a wonderful opportunity. If, if anybody is looking for a way to engage, you can go and teach a, a module for a week. The scholars there are incredible, uh, incredibly dedicated. Um, they really uh, are, they have amazing leadership um, skills. and and they all go back and, and, and build the breeding programs in their home country. So it's a great, great program, and um, it's a really rewarding program to, to work with. We also have international professors in IP Cals. So um, professors who, who live in another department in Cals but do a lot of international work and, and um, want to be part of this cadre of international professors. There are several who, um, whose home department is plant breeding, and, and I've put them up there. Um, I guess, Tim, you would be up there, except your probably home department is crops. <laughs> so um, transnational learning is another aspect of IP CALS. Um, <clears throat> transnational learning sort of operates at the intersection of in information technology, agricultural development, and education and research. And really what, what um, this group that's led by Stefan Einerson aims to do is to um, both improve the um, IT infrastructure in uh, developing countries uh, where, we, where we work and have project partners. And also um, to sort of share all of the intellectual resources at Cornell through e-learning and video conferencing and, and other um, uh, technologies. <clears throat> You often see uh, a video camera in the back of the room at a seminar or perhaps in your course, and sometimes those uh, are built into, created um, as modules and shared with Waki or other project partners abroad. A new initiative that we have in IPCALS is, is AWARE. It's um, Advancing Women in Agriculture Through Research and Education. And this initiative, what we're trying to do is really kind of put a gender lens to everything that we do in IPCALS, whether it's um, you know, considering women and, and the impact of the technologies that we're developing through our projects on women, or um, considering gender in our curriculum, um, in our IARD courses. Um, but you'll hear more about this um, uh, next month, in fact, and I'll, I'll tell you more uh, at the end of the presentation. 
What I want to focus on today, though, is our sponsored projects, because I, I feel like um, that's really where we have a strong uh, connection between our plant breeding department and our, and our plant breed, breeder collaborators and NIP Cal. So I'm going to highlight three of the projects that we have in IP CALS um, currently, where we collaborate really strongly with um, our plant, plant breeding faculty. And this is not a comprehensive list of projects that we have in IP CALS. I haven't addressed a big one that KV leads, the Agricultural Innovations Partnership. So, I mean, hopefully we'll have other opportunities to learn about those projects, but I'm just going to focus on three. And those are um, sort of represented here. <coughs> Our most recent project that was just signed in October and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, NextGen Cassava, um, has several plant breeding collaborators uh, involved. It's John Luke is sort of the scientific lead on the project. Tim Setter leads an objective on um, increasing flowering. Lucas Mueller is involved uh, Martha, uh, from Boyce Thompson Institute. Martha Hamblin, who's here today, is, is heavily involved, as is Jeff Endelman, who I didn't uh, put your photo there. There's a lot of other um, supporting scientists that are involved in this project. Um, the Durable Rust Resistance in Wheat Project is our largest um, sponsored program. Uh, Mark Sorrells is uh, a, a big asset to that project, as is Jessica, his student, who you all know very well, and Ronnie and I um, manage that project. The ABSP2 project was our sort of first big um, sponsored, externally sponsored project. Uh, Peter Gregory was initially involved in directing that project, and it's uh, Frank Shutkowski here on the left, who should be a familiar face, but I think he spends like 10 days a year in Ithaca. He's a man of the road, um, is the director now, and KV Raman is associate director for that project. And again, this is just three of the, of the projects that we have, so I hope I haven't um, offended anyone by leaving any other projects off. <clears throat> so I want to talk to you a bit about the Agricultural Biotechnology Support Project, and KV is here, and, and he is a director on this project, so you know, I don't know if you want to chime in <laughs> at all, KV, but the, this project um, is really aimed at developing and commercializing, commercializing genetically engineered crops um, meant to benefit smallholder farmers in developing countries. And all of these initiatives are um, sort of responsive to the needs and d demands of our partners in, in these national programs. Um, it's not anything that we're sort of, you know, pushing in on them, but, but it has to be demand driven um, from the national um, program partners. This is um, the world's largest public-private partnership for ag biotech products, and it's based here at Cornell, so that's really something. And it's funded by USAID. And this is a project that, um, well, the, the ABSP2 version of the project, uh, I think, started in 2002, and is just shy of $30 million, I think, if that's, KV can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Some of the technologies that have come out of this partnership um, the fruit and shoot borer resistant eggplant being developed for India, Bangladesh, and, and the Philippines. The late blight resistant potato, projects based in India, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Disease and nematode resistant East African highland banana being developed in Uganda. And papaya ring spot virus resistant papaya in the Philippines. Drought and salt tolerant rice in Bangladesh and multiple virus resistant tomato in Mali in the Philippines. And that last one I've uh, is not actually currently being funded um, by USAID. I believe some of the work is still ongoing. <clears throat> so this project really um, deals with a lot of different aspects of the development and commercialization of, of biotech products. So there's the technology development, which is nowadays seemingly the easy part. There's um, policy issues that this project addresses, marketing and distribution, and perhaps um, the area that, that they're spending the most time in lately is outreach and communication, um, trying to get uh, increased public acceptance of these technologies in a lot of countries um, where they have not yet been deployed. The next project that I want to talk to you about is the Durable Rust Resistance in Wheat Project. And those of you in Geneva will hear more about this next month, um, but I'll give you a little preview. 
<clears throat> this project involves um, a lot of different partners, as you can see on this map, over 20 partnering institutions from around the world, all working together to mitigate the threat of this um, fungal disease, stem rust, and, and specifically this new race, UG99. Um, it began in 2008, the project did. Um, and it's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Department for International Development in, UK, in the UK. And it's currently funded at um, a total of $60 million. So um, the background on this project, um, in 1998, a new uh, race of stem rust, UG99, emerged in East Africa. And this race defeats the genetic resistance that's protected most of the world's wheat crop for more than 30 years. Namely, um, most of the world's wheat crop can, um, was protected with a stem rust resistance gene, SR31, that this race overcame. So <clears throat> it was first identified in Uganda, thus the name UG. Um, in 1998, it was named in, in 1999, and then it was subsequently found in Kenya. It's actually likely that the race first emerged in Kenya, but it wasn't um, identified in Kenya first. It was identified in Uganda first. Um, but now we have historical evidence that it was, it was probably in Kenya first. Um, in 2001, they spotted it in Kenya. A couple of years later, in 2003, it had moved to Ethiopia. It then hopped the strait to Yemen, um, moved into Sudan, and is now found as far north as Iran. In addition, it's moved as far south as South Africa. And not only is it moving in space, but it's also evolving. What we used to call UG99, uh, race TTKSK, is actually now a whole family of UG99 um, races. Um, we now know that there are eight members of this UG99 family um, spanning this, this area. So in order to control this pathogen, we've really taken a multifaceted approach that's very inter interdisciplinary and relies on the expertise of scientists around the world um, that come from different areas of specialization. So we have a, a big surveillance effort in this um, project. So uh, making sure that scientists uh, are equipped on the ground to, to monitor and track the movement of this pathogen, and then to contribute surveillance data to our international focal point, um, who's based um, at Simit in Ethiopia. <clears throat> we have a, a large effort to understand the pathogen at, a, at the molecular level. This is a very complex pathogen genetically. Um, and has not been uh, very thoroughly studied. So we're trying to develop molecular diagnostic tools so we no longer have to rely on the art of you know, uh, race typing through differential sets, which is um, really a, a, limit, a limitation and a bottleneck in terms of um, people's ability to do that in a lot of our partnering countries. We also need to consider Barbary, the alternate host of wheat stem rust. Um, it's, this, it's, it's on this alternate host that the sexual cycle of stem rust uh, occurs. So we need to increase our understanding of ro what role Barbary may be playing in the evolution of these new races. And we now have project partners um, from the Serial Disease Lab, University of New Hampshire, and other places that are starting to look in the highlands of East Africa uh, to see if there's Barbary there and if that may be um, what's sort of leading to the evolution of all these new races in East Africa. So traditionally or historically, uh, East Africa has been a hotbed for the evolution of new races. That's not a new phenomenon. And you know, in Kenya, they have year-round green wheat butted up against the, you know, the highlands where this Barbary exists. So this may be um, really what's exasperating this whole phenomenon. Gene discovery is a big um, part of this project. So if we want to build new durable resistant varieties, we need um, more genes to work with in our toolbox. So there's a huge um, push to uh, acquire new genetic resources from wild relatives like agelops and, and, other, um, and other relatives of wheat. In order to use those genes, we need markers. Um, this is an area that Mark's group has been active in, uh, developing um, you know, breeder-friendly markers uh, that, that will help us use these, these new genes and existing genes. 
Breeding is really core to this project. Um, CIMIT is, is, a, is a big partner in developing new varieties. And also Mark's group is instrumental in, in this area of the project in, in using new breeding tools like genomic selection to um, help breed for stem rust resistance. And that's um, Jessica's, part of Jessica's project. Seed multiplication and delivery is a really challenging aspect of the project. Um, in order to you know, get a lot of these countries that are immediately at risk to multiply sufficient seed in case of an epidemic, I mean, that's been a real bottleneck. Um, the seed systems just really aren't, aren't there. And then delivery to farmers and adoption is another challenge. It's hard to convince a farmer to adopt new seeds uh, for a problem that that farmer may have never seen. Um, or you know, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a possible threat. So that's, that's an, another real challenge, especially in countries like Ethiopia, where um, <clears throat> a variety a turnover is, is, is very uh, low. Capacity building is a big part of the project. So um, we have lots of scientists from our partnering countries that come to state-of-the-art labs and learn new techniques in molecular breeding. For example, Mark hosts an Indian scientist each year, and I believe you'll have a scholar showing up very shortly that hopefully you'll all get a chance to meet. Another important aspect of the capacity building part of this project is um, in building these international screening nurseries where all of the world's materials um, are screened for UG99 resistance. So obviously you don't want to take this highly virulent pathogen out of East Africa to challenge your materials in, in upstate New York, um, but rather you want to take your materials from upstate New York and other places um, to East Africa where the pathogen already exists. So all of the breeders around the world who are breeding for UG99 resistance are using these international screening nurseries that are now built up in Kenya and Ethiopia. In Kenya, we screen for, for bread wheat, and in um, Ethiopia, we screen the durum wheats. Gender is another aspect of this project. So we sort of have two um, gender initiative pillars in the project. One is to um, try to recruit and retain more women working in wheat. This is still a highly male-dominated field. So we try to offer professional development opportunities and training opportunities for promising um, early career women in wheat. We have the Women in Triticum Award. Jessica is a, a recipient of that award in 2010. And then the other pillar of our gender initiative is really to ensure that these varieties that we're developing through the project meet the needs of women farmers as well as men farmers. Um, finally, and, and uh, is, is this um, aspect of the project looking at non-host resistance. And this is actually really where the project began. Uh, Norman Borlaug, um, in his final days, did not want to, uh, to pass without addressing this issue of what, what is it about rice that makes it a non-host to rust? And can we take whatever that is and transfer it to wheat? And so he and Ronnie sort of started to build this proposal um, based on this question. And this was a very kind of risky aspect of the project. Um, collaborators in, at CSIRO and at Erie were working on it in the first phase of the project. The proof of concept really wasn't there in time um, for the phase two proposal, so it's not part of the project in, in the phase two. Um, but I think that people are still working on it at Erie and at CSIRO. CSIRO, and hopefully uh, we will um, still begin to understand what it is about rice that makes it a non-host to rust. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we're now in the second phase of this project. Um, the first phase was three years long. It started in 2008. Um, it was a $26 million project. We had a one-year extension that overlapped with the first um, year of phase two, which was funded for $40 million through 2016. <laughs> We're about to begin, um, in a couple of weeks, the uh, year three of this project, the end of the month. And it'll probably be time soon to start writing a phase three proposal. Always in proposal mode, it seems. OK, the next project that I want to tell you about is our most recent project, the Next Gen Cassava project. And this project is really meant um, to improve um, cassava for farmers in, in Africa um, that really uh, subsist on cassava 
uh, an important food security crop. And the goal here is to increase the rate of genetic improvement in cassava for African farmers. And to do that, we're implementing genomic selection. I shouldn't say we. <laughs> Martha and Jean-Luc and, 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 and Jeff and, and, and that team. Um, so that's really the, the centerpiece of this project, bringing genomic selection to, to cassava breeding. Um, we have really fantastic partners. We are working with the Joint Genome Institute at Berkeley, the Boyce Thompson in Institute here uh, through Lucas Mueller's group, um, IATA, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, and then um, most importantly, our Nigerian um, partners from the Nigerian National Program and partners from the Uganda National Program. <clears throat> uh, one of the objectives of the project is to increase flowering and seed set, and that's a part of the project that Tim Setter and his group is leading. And I think you, you, heard more, you, heard, you may have heard about that in a seminar a few weeks ago. Um, Lucas's group is creating a database, cassava base, uh, to collect all of the data that's being generated through this project and to make it uh, available to the rest of the cassava community. And then there are, uh, there's a special initiative to enhance germplasm exchange between Latin America and Africa, something that hasn't been happening fluidly, and also to support a biotechnology and biosafety hub in Uganda. This project is also funded by the Gates Foundation and the UK Department for International Development, and it was funded at, at 25 million. <clears throat> so these three projects, and um, an additional project that I haven't talked about today, the Agricultural Innovations Partnership, um, I would say are largely what has sort of increased our um, sponsored or funds budget in, in the last few years to now um, about 20 million, just exceeding $20 million per year. So I've told you a little bit about what we do, a quick rundown. I want to then again address, you know, who is IP Cals? I mean, really it's anybody in, in Cals who's doing international work, but um, this is our core staff um, in, in this photo. You'll see a lot of familiar faces and, and some who aren't in the photo, such as Frank Shotkowski, Peter Gregory, and Francine Jasper. Um, <clears throat> so if you see some of these familiar faces around the building, uh, they, all, they all belong in one way or another to, to IP cows. We also, as I said, have our international professors who are in plant breeding and, and also associated with our programs. And our um, Waki faculty who are also associated with the plant breeding department. So our project partners um, that are based here at Cornell in, in plant breeding are also part of IP Cals. So that's sort of the tip of the iceberg of, of, of who the IP Cals family is and how we um, connect with, with plant breeding and through whom we connect with. So I hope that I've convinced you that there's a real productive partnership between IP Cals and the plant um, breeding department and, and our faculty and staff. Um, I hope that we can uh, offer you an invitation to work with our office. Um, I would say that you know what we what we leverage from the plant breeding department is that we are sort of the leading plant breeding department, arguably in the world, and so there's a lot of expertise here that can be shared with partners around the world. Um, what IP Cal's brings to the table is 50 years of working internationally. We have the international development experience that a lot of our partnering scientists don't necessarily have. I know when Jean-Luc signed on to this cassava project, he had never been to Africa and had um, you know, very little experience um, working in international development. And there's a lot of challenges there that scientists who have you know, been holed up in the lab don't necessarily um, um, have experience with. So that's something that I think that we bring to the partnership um, in addition to project management, um, financial and contractual support, um, and, and, and other aspects, including a great communications um, and IT support team. I think that in the future, as we face all of the challenges and, and feeding 9 billion by 2050, there will increasingly be a need um, to, to forge more partnerships between people who have the techn technical expertise and people who have the international development expertise. So I hope that if you're you know, interested in responding to an RFA that you see or you'd like to be involved more internationally, that you'll reach out to us and um, let us know how we can work together. 
We're always looking for new groups to collaborate with, new partners, um, and, and as we look ahead to, to solving all of them tomorrow's great and grand challenges. So I just want to take a moment to tell you that this year we're actually celebrating 50 years of International Programs CALS. This is our 50th anniversary. And we have a lot of events lined up um, to celebrate all of our successes and, and some of the issues that um, challenge us today. Uh, we had a launch event last Friday that I think many of you attended. Our next event is Friday, March 8th. Unfortunately, it's the same day as the <laughs> Plant Breeding Student um, Symposium. <clears throat> but Perhaps um, some people can drop in late in the day. We'll be discussing the feminization of agriculture, truths and consequences. Um, in May, we have another event that I think is of particular um, interest potentially to plant breeders. We are inviting Mark Linus, who is a um, former anti-GMO activist who is now um, uh, seen the, seen the, well, I should, the editorial, <laughs> who has now changed his thinking and is now um, in favor of genetically engineered crops um, through his exploration of climate change issues. And he's going to be coming uh, to campus to talk about changing crops for a changing climate and what biotechnology might um, be able to offer in terms of um, uh, solutions to climate change. We're going to have a panel discussion. Our own Margaret Smith will participate in that panel discussion. So that should be an exciting event. Um, we're also having um, an event in September as we start the next fall semester. We will be inviting all of Cornell's um, World Food Prize laureates to come to campus to talk about food policy. Um, we will then have some leading journalists who write about food security uh, discuss uh, the challenges of finding the story in food security. And then we'll have a panel of CALS faculty respond to that and talk about what research is being done to address food security. And um, Rebecca Nelson will be kind of the representing plant breeding on that panel. In October, we have a lot of our prominent alumni from CALS coming back, um, people who have done really interesting um, work in international agriculture across their career. They'll be coming back to talk to current students about you know, their, their experiences on the ground. And then finally in November, another sort of plant breeding, uh, of plant breeding interest event, we are going to be celebrating our partnership with the CGIR centers and we'll have a lot of our own faculty and um, uh, faculty and, and students who have worked with the CGIR Center in various ways, whether it was um, postgraduate or as a student or um, have gone on to work for the CGIR Centers. We'll also have two DGs, the DG of Erie and the DG of Simic, coming to talk um, specifically about opportunities for Cornell students uh, and working and partnering with the CG. So, Look for those events um, as they come up throughout the year, and, and please join us in celebrating our, our 50th year of international programs, CALS, and um, all the partnerships that, that, that we have with plant breeding and other entities in CALS. And with that, I'd like to thank you for coming, and I can answer any questions. I think our seminar chair had to, to flee to go teach, so I'll, I'll man the questions here. Do you want to say a few words about your the Ag Innovation Initiative? Actually, KV should, because he's here and he leads that partnership. Uh, this is a five-year funded project from USAID, and it includes uh, six universities in the US, University of Illinois, University of California, Davis, uh, Cornell University, of course, is the lead, uh, Ohio State University, Georgia, Tuskegee. And in India, we have six universities uh, which are leading this. And it's focused on the Indo-Gangetic Plain, where there are about 220 million people who live below poverty level. When we say below poverty level, it's about a dollar fifty. So the focus there is to actually enhance, uh, there are two key target areas. One is to focus on curriculum, curriculum in the area of uh, the academic curriculum, uh, looking at uh, entrepreneurship and bringing in private sector, which is the key focus in order to increase 
employment opportunities for undergraduates and graduate students who graduate from agriculture universities in India. The second focus is on improving and enhancing extension. So at Cornell, we have the Man Library, which is involved in terms of enhancing library uh, skills and you know improving the library facilities. There's a lot of buy-in from Indian agricultural institutions in order to enhance their libraries. So then the other one is actually creating an e-learning platform where transnational learning program is involved. Uh, the third focus is on actually developing food products uh, at the local level where you can get in some entrepreneurship involved at the undergraduate and graduate level. So we have our food science uh, group involved in a very heavy way, both uh, is we and you know, the number of faculty from food science who are involved there. So I think uh, initially it was funded at about uh, $10 million. Uh, but USAID, you know, when you're working with USAID, you never know. So they have actually rescinded and actually they have cut back a little bit of resources because they want to actually increase the partnership into Africa. So some of the money is going to be actually floated into Africa. So there's another competition which is going on in Africa. So AIP is now bidding in Africa in order to increase this trilateral partnership that's connecting US, India, and Africa. So we have a large uh, project uh, which has been submitted in Malawi. And uh, if you're lucky, we might get about another five million there. Um, from your presentation, I get the idea that uh, Cornell has a lot of international agriculture activity. How do we compare to other universities in the United States? Is our ranking number one? Uh, you see? Uh, it's, uh so, to some degree, it's a little bit difficult to compare our offices as apples to apples because a lot of people are structured in different ways. But Cornell is certainly considered a leader in, in, in international agriculture. Um, and especially when you bring in then the plant breeding department. So then we have two leaders. We have an international, uh, the leadership in international agriculture and the leadership in plant breeding. So that's then a really attractive um, partnership for a lot of donors like the Gates Foundation. So they are quite keen to, to work with us because they see the leadership in both of those areas. But I mean, there's, there's others, you know, Davis is always out there, Michigan State is there in, in certain areas. But in terms of plant breeding and international agriculture, I would say Cornell leads the way. KV, did you wanna, do you have any more to add to that? No, I think, you know, I, she says, uh, when you look at international programs, I think one of the ratings is by looking at uh, the number of uh, grants which you bring in. So where would Cornell rate in terms of other universities? I mean, you know, that's where I think you could make a comparison apples to apples in terms of exact you know, number of grants or number of resources which you are bringing. And I think we are among the top two or three when it comes to resources which are being brought in. Then if you look at the number of professors who are involved in international agriculture, then I think you know, the number of faculty which you have at Cornell would probably rate as among the top two. So. Those external grants, though, for example, don't necessarily always address um, the academic program side of international programs, which is really an important part of what we do. So you know, some people say, well, we've got $20 million a year and we've only got one TA ship. You know, what, what, what's that um, about? But, you know, it's, it's not like it's a giant pot of money that can be used for, you know, anything. It's, everything is, is sort of belongs to a, a different sub uh, category. Any other questions? Well, if you, you know, have any questions later on or you want to work together on a grant proposal, we're up at Emerson Hall and we're happy to work with you. Thanks.